I hope you've been uh, walking along with us over the last few days for the 21 days of prayer. And uh, now we're about a week away from culminating. Uh, next Sunday morning will be the 21st day. And as we've, as we've gone along, it's been a great journey for me. You know, I, I always know this. I know that when the Lord leads me to dedicate a certain amount of time for prayer or prayer and fasting, I know He's going to speak in some way. I know He's going to somehow bring passages of Scripture to light or have someone else uh, say something to me that aligns with what He's saying to me. And, and that's happened a lot over the last 21 days. Last week, I got a note from one of our church members that attends our 8.30 service. And he detailed a few things out of the life of Solomon uh, in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles, where Solomon was leading the people to build the temple at the time. And that just happened to be, not coincidentally, but in the sovereign ways of God, that's where I was in my daily Bible reading. And so the day that card got to me and the reading of my daily Bible reading was just a true affirmation to me in so many ways about the direction we're heading with this 21 days. So I am very excited spiritually, not just because of the plan that we're looking at uh, uh, deciding next week, but because of the potential of what I believe lies ahead. I'm excited about God moving in our heart in that way. So I pray that you'll keep praying with us over the next uh, few days. And culminating next Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, all of us in this one room, we'll have a great time together as we do that. One more thing I might mention, that is, all along the way as we prepare to make decisions like this, we look for teams of people in our church that are deliberating and spending time on the kind of proposal that we're looking at as a church. That would be our Euler's Campus team. That would be our Budget and Finance Committee. It would also be our uh, deacon body. Two weeks ago, or a week ago Saturday, our deacon body did a straw poll, and it was amazing what they said uh, as a result of looking at this question we'll decide next week. Someone said to me, you need to tell the body where the deacons are, so I'm sharing that with you today. I told our deacons uh, on a private piece of paper, just a private ballot, say yes or no or not yet. We recognize that some may not have enough information yet, so yes, no, uh, or not yet. Uh, when we got those back in that deacons meeting, we had six deacons that said not yet. But we had 39 that said yes. Now, since then, I reported that to the deacons uh, by email, and five other deacons have written to me and said, no, mine's a yes as well. So we're about 43 deacons that said yes, zero that said no, six that said not yet. And, you know, that has a way of kind of affirming we believe that we're moving the right direction. So I'm praying for all of us to be able to pray, Lord, is this of you? Lord, what's my part? And Lord, bless your people. But I want you to hear from one couple before I preach today. Very special couple. You'll appreciate what they have to say and how they say it. Watch the video. I'm Mike May. This is my wife, Karen. We've been at this church for over 30 years. I, I'm part of the budget and finance committee at the church, and I feel like it's a chance for me to give back to the church during this really important time where we're making some pretty heady decisions about what lies ahead. And I am part of the Euless campus team. And ultimately the reason why is gratitude. This church has had a tremendous impact and influence on my life personally and in our children's lives. Mm -hmm. You raised us to love the Lord uh, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You taught us the word and um, we're so grateful for that. This project's interesting to us because we no longer have children or youth in our home. They've grown, they've moved out of the house. And so for us, it's purely about ministry, not what we're gonna get out of it individually. As our team was discussing Campus West um, and praying that through and seeking the Lord, uh, what should we do about Campus West? It hit me that he might be giving us this as a double blessing. It blessed us in the past at a time we needed it and great ministry happened there. And then it's a double blessing. He's blessing us once again here in the future that the cell of Campus West could help us tremendously with the funds for the new project. But again, it's not about a building. The blessing of Campus West, if you will, is for the ministry that's gonna happen in the future. Two things in particular that excite me about the project, um, all the family, coming together, tightening up the family. I think that's so important. Mm -hmm. And secondly, this is kingdom work. It's more 
than a building project. It's about mm -hmm. people. It's all those yet to come to Christ, all those yet to love Him, serve Him, and worship Him. That's what's so exciting about it. Over the next five years, I'd like to see the power of God and His favor move upon what we're doing here. I'd love to see our buildings match our ministries. I pray favor on what Brother John preaches. Mm -hmm. I just pray that God would draw new people to His kingdom through the ministries of this church. Thank you, Mike and Karen, for sharing your perspective. So appreciate your, uh, your leadership in this. If you have your Bibles this morning, would you please take them and open them up to Ephesians chapter 5 today as we continue our Where's the Love series. Uh, if you have your Bibles, by the way, just let me know by saying amen. amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 5, if you don't have a Bible, you have uh, under some of the seats, you have uh, copies of God's Word there. Open up your iPhone, your tablet, whatever it is you read God's Word with. And Ephesians chapter 5, let's stand together as we look at one verse in chapter 5 and a few verses in chapter 6 as we deal with the subject of family love. Where is family love? Our Where is the Love series began with agape love, where we talked about the unconditional love of God, loving God with all of our hearts, loving uh, our neighbors as ourselves. Last week, we looked a little bit more about the romantic love, as Russell Gregory brought a great message about Eros love. But today, we're going to be looking at family love. Where is the love in the family today? Because there's a special place and a special word actually used in the Scriptures for how we love family members. Now, let me just tell you this, not a promise, but I preached one of my shortest messages ever in the first service, and if you're lucky, you'll get out a little early today. Again, no promises. I know many of you that know me well say, oh, that's not going to happen, Pastor, and maybe it won't. But let's begin in chapter 5 of the book of Ephesians and verse 33. It comes at the conclusion of a passage that deals with husbands and wives and the power and the mystery of the church and Jesus and man and woman is man and wife. And then verse 33 sums that up. It says, nevertheless, let each individual among you also is to love his own wife. That's the word agape there. Love his own wife even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So there's the love and respect uh, summary of that whole text. Now in verse 1 of chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first command with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Another translation says, do not exasperate your children, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Family love. Father, in Jesus' name, speak to us from this text and others that we'll look at today. As we dig into the question, what is family love? What should it be? What does it look like? How is it lived out? And Father, show us the dangers that we need to be aware of that prevent us from being able to love in a family way those who have been placed biologically and supernaturally in our family. Lord, speak to every heart today, to fathers, to mothers, to brothers and sisters and mom, uh, uh, sons and daughters, Father, all of us in the family. Direct us today, and I ask all this in Jesus' name and our God's people said, Amen. Please be seated if you would. One of the most frequently repeated phrases that I use is the one Oscar Thompson shared in a seminary classroom 35 or more years ago where he said, relationship is the most important word in the English language. And I believe that to be true because everything good I've ever experienced or received from anybody else happens in the context of relationships. I believe it's also true because everything bad that I've ever experienced has also happened through unhealthy relationships. So relationship is a key phrase in our lives. When we talk about love, we're talking about how we express our relationships with other people. And the Bible steers us towards this incredible thing called love. Agape love is the word we looked at a few weeks ago, and it means to love unconditionally. Eros is another Greek word for love that's not found in the Scripture but often referred to, and it's a love that's more erotic, sexual, romantic, uh, magnetic kind of love that happens between a man and a woman. And then phileo is a love that we'll look at next week. It's the word for brotherly love. It means friendship based on commonality. You find brotherly love in the body of Christ, and we'll talk about where's the love for the church next week, and it's an important word. But the word today we're dealing with is the word storgy. 
And stewardship is a word that means family life, natural affection for the family. So in the relationships that are so important for us, how do we exercise this storky love so that we can impact those around us? Now, I read Ephesians 5 as we started this text because Ephesians 5 is the ideal for family. Sometimes when I preach about family or marriage, sometimes when I read the scripture about family or marriage, it's almost uh, disturbing because it sets such a high bar. And when we look at this high bar of Scripture and the high ideal that God calls us to, we think, man, I'm so far from that picture. I'm so far from loving my spouse uh, unconditionally or my children unconditionally, so far from having a perfect family. And I want you to know if you've ever felt that way, welcome to the club of humans. We're all that way. We never measure up fully. Yet Scripture shows us what can be. It shows us what we are to shoot for, what we're to strive for, what we're to pray for. Scripture points what Christ can do in our lives, in our marriages, and in our families. So when you look at this text today, don't be discouraged by it. Just be encouraged that God can do this in your life and in your family. Now notice the words here in this text that are key words. Love, respect, honor, uh, obey bring up or grow up in the Lord. This is the picture. This is the goal of ideal family life. Living out these kinds of conditions and actions, living out this kind of relationship, all focused on the otherness of the situation. You can't have ideal love if you're selfish. You have to have ideal love. You have to have the kind of love God calls us to when you have a healthy sense of otherness. What does it do to them? How does it impact them? How can I affect them positively and powerfully and even permanently by the way I love? Seeing that the other is more important than ourselves, that's a big deal. In the ideal family love picture, we see those placed around us biologically and see them as also placed around us sovereignly. My brother and I did not get along a lot growing up, but at some point we recognized we're in this together biologically, but we're also in this together because God placed us in the same family and we learned to have the right kind of love for each other. Instead of rivalry, it became more of a partnership and that's a big deal. That's what we need to do. But this family love that we're talking about is a proneness to love and to appreciate, to value and to cherish those that God has placed in our own family, our marriage spouse, our father, our mother, our children, our brothers, our sisters, our aunts, our uncles. It's a devotion, it's a dedication, and a unique kind of relationship that we have because we are family. The idea of that Greek word itself, storky, is a proneness to love parents, spouse, children, and family. Let's think about that with me for just a moment. Everything that is healthy in terms of relationship, in terms of love and family, is a condition, it's a a relationship where we learn to talk with each other, talk about the good things as well as the bad things and the tough things, bring up the issues that are not easy for us to bring up so that we can solve problems, so that we can move together as marriage partners or as family together. We need to talk. We also need to trust. Functional families, healthy families, learn to trust one another Make promises that we can keep and only make those promises that we can keep. Be dedicated to one another as we have said and committed and vowed that we will be dedicated together to trust. And then to be able to feel, to feel the affection that comes out of talking and out of trusting. That's a picture of what we need to have. And it all results in family loyalty and family devotion. It doesn't mean that everything's always great. In fact, sometimes it means that you are challenged to the core, and yet at the same time, you have the kind of devotion that says, we're going to work through this together, talk through this together, trust through this together, so that we can feel together all we ought to have as family members in the body of Christ and the power of Christ. One family I know uses this phrase to describe family love. They call it double love. We love everybody else, but we double love our family members. We double love those that are in our household or that have come from our household. And I I think that idea is amazing, to double love one another. You know, I I share this a lot because every time we dedicate babies uh, in our preschool ministry, I have about an hour with them before we come into that day of prayer and dedication for them in this service. 
And I always share with them the stages that I see parenthood taking. This was shared a long time ago with me, and I've, I've used it ever since. It's not something I created, but something I definitely see is, is real. Parents, there are four stages that all of us have when it comes to our children, when it comes to loving them well. The first stage is the caretaker stage from zero to five years of age. You are a caretaker. You never let children out of your sight. At least you shouldn't ever let them out of your sight. You're watching over them. You're being very careful to make sure that everything they do is safe for them and safe for others, and you're helping steer them and guide them. You are the caretaker of those children. From ages 6 to 12, you are the cop, C-O-P. You're the police officer for your children. You're helping them know what the rules are, what the regulations are, what's out of bounds, what's in bounds. And sometimes the discipline that comes as a result of being out of bounds, you're pulling your kids over all the time, asking to see identification and finding out what's next for them at that moment. Always being a cop, because without being a cop, our children grow up without understanding what's right and what's wrong. They grow up thinking if they, have, they don't have a parent that shows them what's right and what's wrong and discipline for those things that are wrong, reward for those things that are right. They grow up thinking they can do anything they want in life without consequence and they are truly dysfunctional at some point. So you have a caretaker stage. Then you have a cop stage. How many of you are in the caretaker or cop stage? Would you raise your hands right now? You got kids in caretaker and cop stage. One of you back there had both hands up at the same time. I guess you've got them in all stages. When a child turns 13 years of age and moves into the teenage years, you become a coach. A coach. You know what a coach does. A coach practices with the team. He huddles with the team, but he goes only as far as the sideline. He can't actually get into the game. He's got to let them be out there playing the game of life. They, they go to school. They're with their friends. They're doing social activities and so forth. And the parent is still watchful, but he can't micromanage the actions of those on the playing field. Now, he can call a timeout, and he or she can bring them over to the sidelines and say, let me coach you a little bit. That was the wrong move to make. Here's the right move to make. Now, get back into the game. And doing that over and over is the coaching stage all the way through the teenage years. Sometimes the coach says, sit down on the bench. You're not going to go out for a little while. Sometimes there are timeouts, but there's always the correction and the encouragement that says you can be the best you can possibly be. How many of you have coaching phases going on in your life right now? Would you raise your hand? All right, all right. So we have caretaker, we have the cop phase, we have the coaching phase, then finally we have what I call the consultant phase. From age 19 on, we are consultants to our adult children. They listen to our advice, they may or may not take our advice. I remember the first time we had a college student come back home from college. She'd been gone for about uh, four, five, six months, and she was used to her own schedule. And I said, well, remember now, the, the curfew's at midnight, and she looked at me like she had never looked at me before. <laughs> I thought, I guess I've just moved from coach to consultant, just right there, right? And I had to maneuver my way through that. But let's think about this. While they're gone, you need to build the kind of relationship where you are asked for and where you are free to give wise counsel and wise consultation for the many decisions they're going to be making in life. They may not always choose your consult or your counsel, but you want to have the kind of relationship, the kind of family love, the kind of affection, the kind of ability to talk, ability to trust, ability to feel where they know that you have their best interest at heart. My youngest just bought her first car. By herself, that is. She's 22 years of age. She's had a couple of cars that I bought, and now she was buying her first car. She called me in as a consultant, so I went with the dealer to dealership with her, and uh, we looked at a nice used car, and she asked my advice, and I said, honey, I think that's the best car you can possibly buy. And I had more joy in that because she made a decision that did not cost me a penny. I loved it. <laughs> not one penny. But you better believe I vetted that car. And you better believe that I'll do anything in my power to give my children wise counsel, the years of experience, all that the Lord has taught me so that they might be the most successful young adults possible. That's what we do. How many of you are in the consultant phase? Would you raise your hands right now? All right. So we never stop being parents. We never stop having family love. 
We never stop having that story key where we do everything we can. And somebody said, well, what about grandparents? What do they do? I call grandparents the, uh, in the baseball terminology, the reliever. They come in and throw some heat for short periods of time to close out the inning so that you can relieve the existing game pitcher, right? Or they're the designated batter that comes up and tries to hit a few home runs. Now, grandparents knows what that means. Grandparents know that means bringing great gifts and taking them cruel places, and then after they're worn out and cranky and tired, giving them back to mom and dad. That's the way that works. But grandparents have this incredible ability to hit home runs, to throw strikes right down the middle of the strike zone so that the next generation can understand all that God has done in your life, grandparents, so that they might see the wisdom that you now have and wiser ways to make life decisions that they will face down the road. You have a credible ability, and because of the power and the ideal of family life, you are invited into the conversation. I love this part of parenting. Here's what my goal is. My goal is that that my children will see Kim and I's love relationship and our faith relationship with Almighty God, that as a result of that and the good relationship we have with them, no matter what, that they will look at our faith, look at our God and say, I want to live my life that way. And parents, that's one of the calls that we have in our life, grandparents as well. The ideal, you see in Ephesians chapter 5 and 6. But then there's a threat. If I could have background music right now, this moment, I can't. But if I were to have background music, it would be the threatening sounds in the movie Jaws, where the shark is circling and danger is imminent. You know this as well as I know, that the threat against family love today is great. In fact, it's so massive that we have somewhat gotten used to it. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy 3 for a moment. 2 Timothy 3. In this chapter, Paul talks about the threat to family love. In fact, this is where the word storge is used, and it's used only in the negative sense. In Romans 1, in a very similar way, and in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, I want you to notice the first five verses that Paul gives us this word translated unloving or literally without family love. Look at what he says. Verse 1 of chapter 3, but realize this in the last days, difficult times will come for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. Here it comes. Unloving, literally without family love, without natural family affection, irreconcilable, malicious gossip, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. I want to pause for just a moment in this passage. And I want to look at some clarity of what Paul is saying here, because he's very, very clear. The word he uses for unloving, ah, storky, which is, without love. It's a heartless lack of love and natural affection and devotion to one's own family. Without natural family affection, without what should take place in every true family between husband and wife, parent and child, brother and sister, they are without this completely. And the essence of why is boiled down into four words for love in this passage. Did you see the four of them? They are lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, and not lovers of God. You know what the threat to the family is today? It is these four loves. Look at how this unfolds. When we are self-loving, money-loving, pleasure-loving individuals, we are without love for God or family. The reason the family is dysfunctional, the reason the family breaks down today, the reason our culture is where it is, is because of self-love, money-love, pleasure-loving people who have no love for God or family. And what this has impacted our families today is what I would call the American version of idolatry. You know, we read the, uh, the, the Old Testament a lot, and we look at how they worshiped idols, but we don't often make similar spiritual parallels to the modern-day Christianity with those Old Testament idols. 
We may not have a carved image sitting on our fireplace hearth that we bow down and worship to, but we have certain things that we love more than God, more than our family, and more than truth. And these four things are mentioned in this passage. Let's look at them one by one. First of all, love of self. Love of self takes away from the sense of otherness and responsibility. I can't consider you because I'm so, I'm so focused on me. I can't think about anybody else because I am so in love with myself. And people like this view the family as a way to get something instead of viewing them as a team to contribute to or to commit to. We call this kind of mindset narcissist today or narcissism. And basically it came from the Greek mythological a mythological story about narcissists who looked at his own image in a pool of water and fell in love with himself. Therefore, everything a person like this does is really done with self-love. Therefore, they're incapable of truly loving others. They are unloving. Love of money is the second. Love of money brings imbalance and enslavement to work and gain, causing us to get our identity from what we do or what we have instead of who we are or who we're with. So we don't have love for family because we have love for achievement or love for things or love for possessions. That's why Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many, many griefs. We ought to look at ourselves very carefully to find out if we love money and achievement and gain more than we love family. I'll never forget a phone call I received a number of years ago. A young man that had been under my mentorship for some years moved to the northeast part of the United States to start a church, to plant a church. He and his wife and their two young children went. About three years later, even though we'd stayed in touch, he called me one day with a very sobering phone call. He said, I have two things to say to you. I said, what? He said, number one, the good news is I became church planter of the year last, last, uh, last year, and I, I saw more gains in our church than ever before or than any other church in our state. I said, that's wonderful. He said, but the bad news is in doing all that, I lost my family. I lost my balance. I lost my perspective. I lost my wife. I lost my family. And we talked about how easy it is to be attracted to achievement and gain, to love that more than we even love our own families. And Paul points that out in his text in 2 Timothy 3. Then finally, lover of ple lovers of pleasure. Lovers of pleasure simply means we crowd out our relationship with God and others. We see others as objects of pleasure instead of individuals to love and serve. God even begins to be someone that we look to and ask for just things that would please us, those that, uh, someone that can get us what we want. He becomes not a sovereign God of the universe that we serve, but a God that we pray to that we hope will serve us. And what I was have to say today is that if these three things are present in your life, you're drifting away from solid ground. You're drifting away from family love, and it's only a matter of time before it's all gone. With six kids, when we would go on family vacations, we would often go to the beach. I was always alert. I would be sure that I had my eyes open watching our kids as we floated in the waves wherever we went. Because I knew this. I knew that if someone floated away, it would only be a matter of time before they would be lost or further out to sea where it would be difficult to rescue or, God forbid, they would be hurt by some sea animal of some sort. So I always kept close watch on them and I would not let them get very far away because I did not want them to drift out to sea. Because the drift is slow, but sure. When we look at these four kinds of love and then the culmination of the fourth one is no love for God either because of these things, then please keep in mind that does not happen overnight. You don't wake up one morning and say, I'm just gonna love money more than I do God. I'm gonna love myself more than I do God. I'm gonna love pleasure more than I do God. You don't wake up one day and do that. You look around one day and say, how far have I drifted? And today, here's what I want to say to you. The reason we can't have good family life is because of the presence of these other things. People who arrive in this place do it gradually. The love of self leads them to relate to others poorly, to be selfish, ruthless, and crude, to lose love for family or even their own children. Most incidents of abortion take place as a matter of convenience. 
where someone doesn't even want to love their own child because they love their own lives more. Love of money causes us to forget who's important. And loving achievement means that we want to achieve things more than a healthy family relationship. Love of pleasure leads us to disloyalty, to moral compromise, to losing natural affection that we ought to have in our families. And really, the, the biggest danger of this is not just what happens to us, but that we pass it on. And eventually, where these four things is this, we don't talk together, we don't trust each other, we don't have feelings for each other that God has given us the proneness to have if we're following him in a balanced way. And then our children grow up with the inability to talk, to trust, to feel, and the inability to be wise in life. That's called dysfunction. But as so often as true as is true of the scripture, there is a solution to that. Aren't you glad the Bible always gives us the problem, but it also always gives us the solution? Can I get an amen for that? As Paul walks to 2 Timothy chapter 3, he offers an incredible solution. Go on down to verse 14, if you would, of 2 Timothy 3. And here's what he says as he concludes his conversation in this letter. You, however, in contrast to all that, continue in the things you have learned to become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writing, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I'm one of the privileged ones. I watched my father love my mom well, love my brother and I well, and love his church in a balanced way. He was a pastor. For 67 years, he somehow found balance. Somehow, he carved out time. Somehow he did all the important things so that I could see his life was transparent. It was clear. He was real. What he said in the pulpit and how he lived at home were consistent, absolutely consistent. So if I turn out bad, I have no poor example to blame. But the reality is he gave me an inspiration. And that inspiration was to be what he was to me, to my family, to my children. Now I want you to know today, my dad wasn't perfect. He wasn't ideal but he always knew what that ideal goal was. He was always shooting for that and always depending on the power of Christ for that. When Paul concludes this chapter, he says there are three things basically that help us solve the problem that he presents with this self-love, love of pleasure, love of money, no love for God. And they are threefold. Number one, personal conviction, continuing the things you've been convinced of. My father lived out his convictions Here's what Scripture says we can be. Here's what Scripture calls us to be. Here's what Scripture tells us to turn away from. And here's what Scripture calls us to embrace. And I watched him do that day in and day out. And that's what I'm called to do. And that's what you're called to do, to know and be convinced in your heart that Scripture has the perfect picture of how we ought to be. That Christ gives us the pattern by which we're to have family life. Secondly, it's personal salvation. There's no way that you and I could live out these convictions without the power of Christ in our lives. Someone said it like this, we're saved from all of our sin when we come to faith in Christ, but we're also saved from ourselves when we come to faith in Christ. All my inadequacies, all my inability, all my weaknesses, all the things I can't live up to or can't measure up to, I am saved from that and given the power of the Holy Spirit from the inside out to help me be what I could never be without Christ. Personal conviction, personal salvation, personal sanctification. Paul says, at the end of it all, it's Scripture that begins to turn you. It's Scripture that begins to convince you, convict you. It's Scripture that empowers you to be all that you're called to be. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable. It'll help you when you get off the path. It'll turn you back on. It'll instruct you in the ways that you're to walk in. So I ask you today, do you have personal conviction? Has God spoken to you today about what kind of father you ought to be, what kind of mother, what kind of son or a daughter or brother or sister or grandparent you ought to be? And as the Holy Spirit of God speaks to you with conviction, know this, that without personal salvation, there's no way to get there, no power to get there on your own. Every person in this room today, 
If they want to have the kind of family love that God designed for us to have, ought to ask the number one question, am I a child of God? Have I made sure that I've been forgiven of my sins? And have I made sure that I'm being rescued from myself by the power of the risen and resurrected Jesus Christ? And I will tell you, this is the best day in the world to make that decision. And then to ask the question, am I being sanctified day by day? Am I being washed by the water of the word? Am I letting the word of God guide me and direct me and correct me and convict me and bring me to the place where I ought to be? And if not, I need to make a decision to let it be that way. Paul says, do you want to know what's going to change the picture of these last days and all these people that are moving the wrong way? Personal conviction, personal salvation, personal sanctification. So where are you today? with your family life. You struggle to give it, struggle to make time for it. You struggle to have the kind of affection the Bible points to as the ideal for your family. And come to Christ now. Make sure now you let him change that. One of my best friends in life is a guy named David. David uh, was in our church in Tennessee. And David's testimony is kind of incredible. He and his wife both came to faith uh, after uh, they were living together and then married and after they had children even. So David actually had two kids before he came to faith in Christ. And he and his wife realized we're kind of behind. As they began to read the Bible, they realized we have not taught our children the right things the first few years of their life. We've got to make up for some lost time. And so David and his wife began to very consistently, diligently make decisions and make time and uh, be the man and woman they were supposed to be for their children. And as he tells the story, he tells the story of a lot of struggles, but also a lot of victories. And now he looks back to his family years down the road and says, you know, God helped us make up for that lost time. And my family is now moving the direction they ought to move in, in spite of all the errors that we had early on in life. The kind of decision that you need to make today is the kind of decision that David and his wife made years ago when they realized there was no way that they could have the family love, the picture that God called them to have and, and, and to live in without the power of Christ himself. Don't have a form of godliness and deny the power. You need to place Christ as center of your life so that you'll have the power of transformed relationships. Would you bow your head for just a moment, close your eyes. In just a moment, I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna stand and sing a an invitation, a song, and I'm going to invite you to respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Father, in Jesus' name today, I ask you as you move in our hearts. There are moms and dads, there are grandparents in the room, there are brothers and sisters in the room, sons and daughters. Father, I pray that you would move in each of our hearts. Lord, as only you can do, I pray that you'll pinpoint where we are individually. Pinpoint the changes that need to take place. Bring conviction, even godly fear to our hearts of the importance of listening to your voice right now. So many things that we've talked about today, Lord, are things that are very present in the world in which we live in. Self-love, pleasurable love, love of money, not loving God, having a form of religion or godliness, but denying the power of Father. Speak to us about those things. And then, Lord, I pray that you'll speak to us about what can be, what you've called us to, the potential, the power of your presence in our life to get us there. So, Lord, speak to us.